SpaceX's third generation antennas are coming. Hey everybody, welcome back to the channel. Thank you so much for once again joining me for Tea Time. Today we have a little bit of fireside. That smokiness of the lap song, so good, so good. I hope you're joining me with your cup of tea, maybe a cup of coffee, hanging out, talking tech, talking photo, talking video. Today is a tech day. We're gonna be talking about Elon Musk, SpaceX, Starlink's brand new antennas. He's actually testing a whole crap ton of them. He finally got approval from the FCC today to test about 200 new options, new antennas, um, new variants, let's say, to eventually create the next generation antenna. There has been gigabit thrown around in the interwebs as of late, but I don't think we're gonna see that as of this generation three antenna. Let me just tell you that right out. But I do think that speeds are going to get faster with the new generation antenna. I do think we will see like less rain fade. There's probably gonna be less congestion going on. It's gonna be a quicker system. Obviously we need a new antenna to be able to integrate with these new satellites that are up there. We already have some generation two satellites up there that are communicating inter-satellite from satellite to satellite using lasers. So the need for ground stations are starting to go a little bit the way of the dinosaur. We're still gonna need ground stations, we're gonna need pops, but we're not gonna need as many for the number of people that will be on the system. So originally when I first came aboard, there was like maybe, I was probably the first 50,000, 100,000 of the residentials that actually got it way back when it first came out, coming out of beta, whereas now we're over a million. That is a lot of customers. And I would project there's gonna be another million coming through 2023 or even more. So we're gonna see congestion get worse, but I think that there's a lot going on on the back end right now to improve on that, to make the system more stable. And I think that's what a lot of Starlink users want. They want stability. They don't want these frequent or even infrequent outages. They don't wanna be down. They don't want the speeds to fluctuate so greatly. They want service very similar to terrestrial service, like their cable or their fiber. Now, that is very hard to be able to accommodate when you're dealing with satellites flying around the planet at 17,000 miles per hour. But I digress. We're gonna get into this article. I wanna read some of this to you that PC Magazine put out. I wanna get into what I think the larger story is here before the end of this video. And that kind of gets into the idea of, should I upgrade to the business class version or the HP high performance, some call it the HD antennas, the high performance antennas that we see that run about $2,500 in comparison to 600 for the antennas that we're using. So I wanna get into that before the end of this video. So hang in there. Before we get into any of this, I wanna say that if you haven't downloaded any of my eBooks as of yet, go check them out. Go over to jchristina.com forward slash books. Once again, jchristina.com forward slash books. Also, if you enjoyed this content, even a little bit, just a tiny bit, please consider giving it a thumbs up. That'll be very, very helpful. Also, if you're not subscribed to the channel, please do so. And then click this little button over here so when I go live and when a new video comes out, you'll be notified of it immediately. And when you click that button, click all. This way you'll actually get the notifications. YouTube's still working on it. Also, if you want more Starlink content, I have about 110 plus Starlink videos in a Starlink playlist that I put together for you guys. So go check out that Starlink playlist. I'll put a link over there, I believe. And if you wanna to contribute to the channel, there's a little button down there that says thanks. You can click on that, throw a couple of bucks for my hard work, that would be fantastic. But if you don't want to, that's even better. Become a member of the channel. That would make me extremely happy. Also, if you're looking for a VPN, a virtual private network to secure your family or your business with 256-bit encryption, military grade, the nice folks over there at Pure VPN have given us a link. That link will give you about 80 plus percent off. So down below in the pinned comment, as well as the description, go check out that link. Give it a click and pick up Pure VPN. So anyways, let's get into this article. This is kind of fun because it's really telling what is going on with the SpaceX Starlinks, their antennas, their service and everything going forward into 2023. 
It looks like SpaceX is already working on the next generation DISH hardware for the Starlink satellite internet service, according to FCC documents. I'm gonna read a few of these documents to you in this video, so hang in there. On Tuesday, today, the FCC granted SpaceX a temporary license to test, quote, new user terminal hardware. A document from the company adds the test will cover, quote, next generation phase array antennas designed to connect to Starlink satellites. The hardware will include both fixed position Starlink dishes and those that can be used in motion, such as cars, boats, planes, trains, whatever, spacecraft. The company plans on testing up to 200 models featuring dimensions not to exceed 23 inches by 15.1 inches. That means the hardware will be slightly larger than the second generation Starlink dish for residential customers, which was introduced back in November, 2021. It too has a rectangular shape, but with a dimension of 20 inches by 12 inches. That's the one that we are currently using. Meanwhile, the first generation Starlink dish adopted a circular shape with a diameter of 23 inches. Quote, this testing will allow SpaceX to categorize the performance of these user terminals under a wide range of conditions and to measure the RF or radio frequency density of emissions from these user terminals. Now, this was put into the FCC filing. Now let's bring this up. Now this is the FCC filing. I'm gonna read through some of this to you because if you're not seeing it on your screen and you're listening to me through a podcast, well, I need to read it to you, right? So this is the test description. It says, through this authorization, SpaceX Exploration Holding seeks to test user terminals in fixed and eSIM configurations at transmit duty cycles up to the commission's occupational slash controlled exposure limits. In other words, we're not gonna burn anybody with RF signal like off the chart. The testing will involve up to 200 total user terminals, including a combination of fixed devices and ECMs, which may include a combination of earth stations on vehicles, vessels, and aircraft to be operated exclusively by SpaceX personnel. This testing will allow SpaceX to categorize the performance of these user terminals under a wide range of conditions and to measure the RF density of emissions from these user terminals. The Earth station terminals requested will enable SpaceX to fully evaluate the operational characteristics of these terminals under conditions that resemble the initial commercial rollout of these devices to the greatest possible extent. Background. The commission has already granted SpaceX Service Inc. a blanket authorization to commercially deploy an unlimited number of fixed and ECM user terminals that communicate with SpaceX's NGSO constellation. NGSO is non-geostationary orbit. The commission also previously authorized SpaceX to conduct testing of fixed and ECM user terminals in a variety of configurations. With this application, SpaceX seeks to authorize testing of new user terminal hardware, interference protection. Although SpaceX intends to test multiple potential user terminal configurations, all will share the technical characteristics listed below and will operate within the EIRP density mass provided in this document. So as you can see here, we see broadband downlink and broadband uplink, basically space to earth or earth to space. And you can see the different frequencies that are being used and the amount of watts. I think that's about seven watts with about 44.5 dBW, which is decibel watts, which is that earth to space connection. The proposed operation will protect other systems from interference generally by complying with the same limits that apply to other authorized SpaceX user terminals and to the SpaceX Earth Station Network as a whole. These measures are further described in a separate attachment. The operation described in this application would occur only under controlled conditions and would not involve members of the public. Thus, under the FCC's current RF exposure guidance, these SpaceX user terminals may operate at duty cycles up to 73%. The appropriate limit for occupational exposure under the current OET guidance. The details of this radiation hazard analysis are included as a separate attachment to this application. 
So that's kind of like what it looks like. Now they finalize the article with this. The 200 models will also consist of multiple potential user configurations, but all will be designed to receive download and upload over the 10.7 gigahertz to 12.7 gigahertz and 14 gigahertz radio band. The FCC license allows SpaceX to test the hardware in five locations, including Los Angeles, Mountain View, California, Redmond, Washington, Riverton, Wyoming, and Cape Canaveral, Florida. That's right up the road from me, about two hours. The testing indicates SpaceX might be preparing to upgrade the DISH hardware for Starlink in the near future. Like I was saying, I think this will be a generation three SpaceX Starlink antenna. The company's goal is to eventually offer gigabit internet speeds over its satellite internet system. It has also been working on decreasing the manufacturing costs for the Starlink dish. But in the meantime, SpaceX is trying to reduce the network congestion facing Starlink, which has been dragging down network speeds. So. The difference here between this dish that they're working on and the original dish is a few inches. So instead of the dish, like the one that we currently have being 20 inches by 12 inches, the new one is going to be more like 23 inches by 15 inches, let's call it. Whereas the dish that you could currently get, which is the high performance dish, is like a square instead of a rectangle, that is 22 inches by 20 inches. So it is bigger, but it's a little bit more square. The new dish configuration while remaining rectangular is 23 inches long. So it is longer on the long side, but about 15.1 inches on the wide side. Now, the other dish or the high performance dish is 20. So it's about five inches thinner, but a little bit longer. So I'm thinking that this dish is not going to be as good, let's say, as that array that they built or the antenna that they built for high performance, but it will be larger than the current one that is being used. So I'm going to guess that we're going to end up with less rain fade, number one, maybe possibly a little bit more stable of a connection. Because my understanding is with the business class or that high performance dish that is square, there is less rain fade and there is less downtime when there's like little blips where it can't find a satellite or the satellite is out of view. The array is basically connecting to a larger swath of sky, let's say, all right? So the same thing holds true with this. The new dish will be longer at about 23 inches in comparison to the current dish, which is 20, but also it is going to be a lot wider at 15 inches in comparison to 11.9, let's call it 12. So it will be a larger dish. So for me, I think that if you are in the market for a business class setup and you need that let's say reduction in raid and fade, and you need to be up all the time and have less downtime, and you need the extra bandwidth, well, this business class is probably gonna still be for you because it is $2,500 for the dish, which is expensive in comparison to the 600, but your cost is going to be $500 per month compared to 110. It is a major bump up, but if you can wait, and not spend the $2,500 on the new dish because some of you don't know this, you can actually buy that high performance dish today and connect it to your $110 service, which will give you once again, a larger view of the sky, probably a little bit less rain fade and whatnot. But remember, you are still on that same plan. What that means is you're gonna have the same data cap unlike the business class. And what that also means is you are going to be throttled to the same speed, even though the dish could probably handle a faster speed. There is throttling going on with SpaceX Starlink. I talked about it in tons of videos and that's just simply the way it is. The main difference is, is you're gonna end up with a little bit more of a stable signal in my personal opinion. So I'm really excited about this because we're going to see that generation three probably come out by the end of 2023. If they are now doing all of their testing, I mean, it doesn't take them long to ramp things up. 
So it could even happen by mid-year. We'll see the new dishes start being shipped out. And at that point, they might allow us as residential customers to upgrade to this new one, maybe at the same cost as the original one that we bought, $4.99, $5.99. It depends on when you came aboard. Because for me, I really wouldn't mind a dish that's going to allow me to have a better connection, a more stable connection, probably a little bit better or a more stable latency. It doesn't bounce around as much. And then also less rain fade, because if you know it or not, these things are susceptible to rain fade. When it is pouring out, it is really difficult to get a signal from space. That's just how it is. So we'll see what ends up happening with all this. Once again, I am excited about it. I want to hear from you. Are you? Do you think this is something that you would buy? Would you get this new third generation dish if it is the same cost as the old one in comparison going with a business class or a high performance class that costs $2,500 for the antenna? I know I would. I don't have $2,500 laying around. I wish I did. <laughs> Anyways, before I get out of here, I want to say go check out my website over at jchristina.com where you can find all the photography tools that I've invented for you and me over the many years. And hopefully there's something there that you might like. And if there is, please pick it up and support me and my family. That's it, guys. I'm out of here for yet another vlog. Many blessings to you and your family. Stay safe, stay healthy, and we'll see you in the next one. Love you all.